Welcome to Logos Live. Today we get to nerd out about a topic that I care rather deeply about with a biblical scholar whose work I appreciate, Dr. Mark Strauss. Dr. Strauss's brand new book in the popular 40 Question series is 40 Questions About Bible Translation. I've been reading it. I love this 40 Questions format. It's a good book. Dr. Strauss, could you start by just telling us about yourself a little bit? How do you serve the body of Christ? Yes, um, great to be with you, Mark, by the way. Thanks for having me. Um, I am University Professor of New Testament at Bethel Seminary. Um, I'm based in San Diego. We used to have a campus in San Diego, and now I'm fully online with Bethel. But I've been with them since 1993, so about 30 years. Um, I teach New Testament. I teach hermeneutics. Um, I teach Bible translation occasionally um, and do a lot of work in Bible translation. Kind of started out as a hobby of mine and then uh, became a passion and um, then a big part of my, my research and my, my ministry. Well, that leads me right into the question I wanted to ask you. I really don't know the answer to this. Uh, you and I have met before. We met at ETS last year, I think it was. We've uh, talked a little bit back and forth about Bible translation. I don't know, though, how did you get into Bible translation? How did you get onto the NIV committee? Like, what was the path? Even go back a little further like you were just doing. Yeah, that's actually quite a long story that I'll, I'll keep, keep short. I've been fascinated by language for a long time. Fascinated by the Bible, of course, and the Bible has been a passion of mine. And so when you bring language together with the Bible, it means you're fascinated by Greek and how language works and how you translate it, all of those things. Um, and um, I always would teach my students the nature of language, that um, how words work, for example, that words have different meanings depending on the context and you have to follow the meaning in context. I remember I was teaching a, a class on Philippians, a Greek exegesis class on Philippians. And one of my students said, hey, if what you say about language is right, why does the NIV translate the Greek word Adelphoi as brothers instead of brothers and sisters? And I said rather naively, don't you think brothers is inclusive? And everyone in the class said, no, it, it isn't. It sounds like it's referring to males. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Maybe it should be translated brothers and sisters since that's clearly what it means. And I wrote a little naive article called Gender Bias in Bible Translation and prepared to present it. I gave it at a presentation. Um, it really made no difference. There were like four people at the presentation. It was a regional ETS meeting. Um, but that same year, a controversy broke out um, related to the NIV and a version of the NIV that had been produced in Great Britain that was introduced more gender inclusive or gender accurate language. The Brits were demanding that. They were saying the NIV just sounds so male, it's not fo it doesn't translate accurately according to contemporary English. Um, and I, because I was writing that topic already, I got wrapped up in that debate. Um, basically, uh, I listened to what those who were attacking this gender inclusive or gender accurate language were saying, and what they were saying was just wrong. I mean, it was linguistically wrong, it was hermeneutically wrong. They would be saying things like, well, the Greek says man, so we should translate that way. Well, the Greek didn't say man. The Greek said anthropos, a Greek word that generally means person, not man. And we, when we translate it as man, we sometimes make it sound more in exclusive than it actually is in the original Greek. Or the Greek word adelphoi, as we just mentioned, it frequently means siblings or brothers and sisters. And so when they would say, the Greek says brothers, so we should translate that, well, that's just wrong. And so I began writing against uh, challenging my um, friends who were def trying to attack these versions. And I think through that work, I published a book um, called Distorting Scripture, The Challenge of Gender uh, uh, Bible Translation and Gender Accuracy. And through that work, the NIV committee, which was moving in this direction of introducing more gender accurate language, asked me to join them. And in 2005, I, I, was, I became a member of the, the CBT, the Committee on Bible Translation, for the New International Version. Yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah, that obviously makes perfect sense. And I want to get back to gender language and scripture in a little bit. But let me ask first, what is it that you actually do on the NIV committee? You personally, how do you contribute to the meetings of the Committee on Bible Translation? Right, well, I contribute the way every member contributes, and so I'll give you a little background to the, the CBT, the Committee on Bible Translation. It's a 15-member group um, of biblical scholars. Um, there's been a CBT since the 
uh, NIV was translated in the 1960s, it is met continuously. Every year, the CBT meets um, uh, the, about 100 or so translators translate the NIV, but a committee of 15 oversees the translation. And so each year we meet and proposals are sent in over the course of the year, proposals from scholars, proposals from pastors, lay people, um, even denominations themselves have sent in lists of proposals. And we get those proposals ahead of time individually. We study them, we come together for this week, sometimes more than a week if we've fallen behind in our proposals. Um, and we, we discuss them and vote on, vote on them. Um, it takes a super majority of about 70% to pass a proposal. So it's kind of a philosophy, if it's not broke, uh, don't fix it. And so a lot of proposals don't make it. Um, um, wh when they do make it and are approved, they of course aren't introduced immediately into the text. It would be terrible to have a new text coming out each year. But when a new revision comes out of the, a new edition of the NIV, then th those proposals uh, that, have, that have been changed over the course of, pr uh, since the last revision, um, are all introduced. So 1984 was a major revision. That's the NIV most people today know until the 2011 came out. And the, the present edition is the 2011, which did introduce more gender accurate, accurate language. That was part of a little bit of the controversy related to that version. Uh, the committee, let me just add, the committee is, we try to keep the committee diverse. It's an, it's an English translation, obviously, but we have English speakers in Canada, in Great Britain, in India, in Anglophone Africa, um, in Australia. So we have representatives from all of those places on the NIV committee. Um, a variety of denominations, uh, all evangelical in the sense that all have a very high view of scripture, but um, a diversity of denominations. Uh, we have gender diversity, um, only a few women on the committee at this point. We should have greater gender diversity but working in that direction, but uh, then ethnic diversity, as I mentioned. Um, in, uh, member from India, a member from Africa, Australia, Canada, um, and the UK. So that's a little bit about the, the committee. Super interesting. I, I think from my perspective that diversity is important because it helps steward the trust of the church in this work. It makes people out there think, okay, it's not just one party or sect or sure, one gender who has overruled every other on this committee, but we're trying to put a, a, a broad but still evangelical base underneath this translation, which I've got right here. This is one of my favorite editions of the NIV. It's the NIV Reader's Bible, the one that has no uh, verse numbers or chapter numbers in the text. I find that, well, it has Psalms. Psalm divisions, of course, that makes sense. But um, I find that to be a really helpful format for reading scripture. I've read through the NIV multiple times. It's going back to 1999 or 98 when I first got uh, an NIV. Of course, that would have been a 1984. I have profited from it over and over and over again. I especially remember first really feeling like the Proverbs <laughs> made more sense in the NIV compared to the King James on which I'd grown up. Now, I have a really important question. We're on, we're on Logos Live. Do you use Logos, Dr. Strauss, or do other NIV translators, members of the Committee on Bible Translation, do they use it? Oh yes, I, I know they do. I mean, it's often open, you can see when we're working together. And I do use Logos. I have to admit, I, I also use one of your competitors together with Logos, but I use, I, I, <laughs> I've always used Logos. Um, and I mean, Logos is obviously an amazing um, Bible study tool and particularly the, the, the size of the library. I mean, I, I have hundreds and hundreds of volumes on my little laptop, and it's amazing um, what you can consult, the kind of study you could do. I could, if I was on a desert island, I'd take my laptop, and I could work for 20 years in terms of doing biblical research because of the Logos software and the, the Logos library. So it, it is a remarkable tool, and um, I frequently encourage students uh, to get it, especially when they ask what Bible software should I get, I, I set out the benefits of Lagos, and um, yeah, it's, it, it's one, of the, one of the stellar, most important Bible we, software tools. We appreciate that, and you know, we have to pay the piper, but I also just personally care. I love the software, and I'm glad to see that the resources <laughs> we worked so hard to create in the software 
that we've worked so hard to shape would be useful for a very practical thing. You know, people got to open up their Bibles and read it in their language. And the kinds of arcane discussions that you guys have to go through on the CBT are facilitated by that software. Now, let me turn to your new book, 40 Questions About Bible Translation. I mean, let me just ask the classic question of all interviewers. What made you write this book? You know, what need did you perceive? And let me ask one more together with that. Who came up with these questions? Yeah, I've written a little bit on Bible translation in the past. I wrote the book on gender language originally, and then Gordon Fee and I wrote a book called How to Choose a Translation for All It's Worth, part of the How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth series there. And um, that little volume was written in, in the context of the debate over you know, the changes in the NIV that were taking place and attacks on the NIV. And, and so it really focuses on Bible translation philosophy and approach and defends a more functional equivalent or idiomatic approach to translation. And that was great. I really enjoyed and you know, to write with uh, a master like uh, uh, Gordon Fee was just an honor. And so um, I really enjoyed doing that. Um, but this book, um, when it was offered to me, um, I really was excited to do this because the 40 questions format allows uh, sort of a, a broader scope of study. Um, most books on Bible translation either cover maybe the philosophy of translation or cover the history of translation or survey modern Bible, English Bible translations. With the 40 questions format, we, it could sort of cover the gamut. And so we have six major sections in the book and we cover everything from the, the history of translation, the philosophy of translation, the um, prep preparing to translate. Uh, there's a section on international Bible translation. What's the most popular Chinese Bible in the world, for example, Chinese language Bible in the world. And uh, so, so that gamut was really enjoyable for me um, to, to, to pursue. Um, yeah, so uh, the other thing is the, the book with Gordon Fee came out in 2007. So we're talking about um, a long time. A lot has changed in the field. Uh, that was right in the middle of the TNIV controversy, which has long since been resolved, and so it's dated a bit in that regard. So just keeping up with where contemporary translations are. The gender language debate has advanced, and now versions that were originally opposed to it have now adopted the same kind of language. That's a whole other story. But so that, that needed, needed some updating as well. So I, I sensed a little bit of a sigh as you were spelling that out in this book. Like, uh, I had to fight so hard about this and now everybody's doing it. Yes, I know that feeling. Um, uh, who did come up with all the questions? I asked so many questions oh, back to back, but mm. I want to get oh, that yeah. one answered. Yeah, they, um, they proposed some questions and then I came back with my proposal for the book and they agreed to that and then that changed pretty significantly over as I was writing you know a, a question you know a question would become less relevant if I had dealt with it in one question and then another question would arise so I was really pleased by the end of, of where the questions came out but if you look at the the proposal original proposal it's significantly different than the actual questions that came out. It's a fast, it would be a fascinating study to go back and look at, he, at the, you know, the original and then where it actually arrived at in the end. I really like yeah. where it arrived in the end. I love this format. I've now read several of these 40 questions books, and it does feel like you just get to expand your horizons a bit. I do feel like now we need another whole 40 questions book on world Bible translation. You, you don't spend a whole lot of time yeah. on it oh, at the exactly. end. Um, I don't think that would be overkill at all. You know, um, this book reflects right at the beginning and then, you know, all throughout. There are mentions of the debate between literal slash formal on the one hand and dynamic slash functional approaches to Bible translation on the other. And as I read this, I I felt, you know, this is so clear. Your, your work is very helpful. Um, I'm certainly in a very similar place to where you are, but I also found myself a little frustrated, not with you, but with the state of the debate. I have been hearing about this since I was a kid, literally. I remember talking about this with my father, and I just found myself saying, will this argument ever come to an end? <laughs> and will it? Uh, no, it probably won't. Um, I think, um, you know, and, and it's no secret that I'm an advocate of functional equivalent translation or idiomatic translation. Um, but I think um, intuitively, you know, when, when we approach the debate, um, when you do a translation, you want to, 
to be accurate. And so we would kind of intuitively think that the closer we are to the form of the original, the closer we follow the original, the more accurate the, the text is going to be. Um, and in a counterintuitive way, when you look at the reality, that's simply not the case because languages are different. And so, you know, the goal of formal equivalence is a noble goal. It's to be accurate. Be, um, but then because languages differ, both in terms of the meaning of words and in terms of grammatical structures, that simply, it simply doesn't work. And it doesn't take long to realize that it doesn't work. I mean, any beginning student, take an introductory Spanish class, and you quickly learn that um, if you try to say things word for word, translate things word for word, they don't come out right. And, you know, this is... In, in my discussions and lectures and presentations, um, this has been probably the easiest thing to prove because you simply say a, a phrase like, you know, Spanish, como se llama is the one I, I constantly return to, or cuantos años tienes. Como se llama is, is, if you translate that phrase literally, word for word, it's how yourself call, how yourself call. And that makes no sense in English. We would say, what's your name? We completely change the grammatical form in order to communicate the meaning. And so ultimately, the goal of translation is to reproduce the meaning of the text. And, and if you just look at the way translation is done internationally, if you went to the United Nations, for example, and heard a speech being translated, spoken, and then translated simultaneously into 100 languages, nobody would be translating literally. They'd get fired on the spot because it would be pure gibberish. Instead, they take the meaning of the text and then reproduce that meaning in the idiom and vocabulary of the receptor uh, of, of the target language. And so um, that's just the way language works. And so, um, you know, defending that has been an important part of my career because biblical scholars who know, who are immersed in the Hebrew and Greek um, are constantly looking at the Hebrew and Greek. So the tendency is to reproduce that Hebrew and Greek as, as accurately as possible. And often we have to stop and say, but is that English? Would anybody actually say it that way? Um, and most of the time, you win it. There's not a single verse um, translated in any English translation that is actually literal, that follows exactly right. and precisely the grammar of, of, the, of the original, which tells you there's a problem with your methodology right. if it fails in every <laughs> sentence of the, of the Bible. Right. You, you helped me see that years ago in an article. I don't even remember where I read it. I, I want to say it was in Jets. Uh, and and you, you actually used this earlier in our discussion interview here when you said, the, well, the Greek doesn't say man, it says anthropos. You know, the, all translations change every single word. And all translations necessarily change the structure of e nearly at least every sentence. I mean, maybe Jesus wept is the same. I haven't actually looked at it. Um, <laughs> one disarming thing that you did in the book, however, you know, you've got a side, but... I appreciated the way you acknowledged that there are strengths of the literal and formal approach to translation, and you acknowledge there are weaknesses to the dynamic and functional approach. So um, how did you get away with not being a partisan? Was that tough to do? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think probably um, in, my, in my other writing, in my thought process, I, I've one of the things I, I've really moved towards is we need to be better critical thinkers in the evangelical world. Uh, we tend to form opinions very quickly. Uh, we have a tendency to do knee-jerk reaction. We, we have a tendency to defend our perspective at all cost. Um, when I think first and foremost, we need to understand the issue. And understanding the issue means understanding your opponent's position. I always tell my students, you should never attack a view until you can defend it. Um, and, and until you can defend it with the best arguments possible, because you don't understand where it's coming from until you can defend it. And I think that relates to so many different areas of life. It relates to theology, it relates to politics, it relates um, to worldview. Um, and so uh, I think that, that idea that um, we need to understand it first. Why do so many people defend a more literal or formal equivalent translation philosophy? Well, there's good reason for defending it, and, and this is what you know, th these are the strengths of it. So I think that perspective that we need to um, approach things with a critical mindset and we need, to, we need to critique our own view as well and realize that there are weaknesses of our own view. So, uh, you know, there is a reason for people defending formal equivalent. So wh what is that reason? Is it because it's more accurate? I would say, no, it's not more accurate, but in certain ways it preserves aspects of the text that a functional equivalent version cannot. 
Yeah, and I send readers straight to the book to explore some ex specific examples. I did not feel like you said that half-heartedly. I felt like whenever I see anybody in debate who acknowledges strengths to his or her opponent's position, I find that to be more persuasive. You know, me personally, let me just bounce off of you the place I've landed practically. Over the years, over many years, I mean, 30, I have felt like, okay, I've got to come down on a side. I've got to be either formal, literal, or I've got to be functional, dynamic. And I'm going to pick it and stick with it. And then I started to realize as a young man, as a seminary student, even if I picked a side, there's no way I'd be setting aside the translations that exist on the other end of the spectrum. So if I'm more formal and literal, if that's what I tend to prefer, there's no way I'm going to stop checking the NIV when it's helped me so many times. Mm -hmm. And if I preach in a certain setting as I did for five and a half years from the new international readers version to a functionally illiterate group of mm -hmm. people in an outreach oh, wow. ministry, I absolutely loved it. Mm -hmm. There's no way that I'm going to say, okay, well, this is my translation for all time. I'm never even going to look at the ESV and the NASB. <laughs> so I've not been called upon to make a once for all decision on which side is right. I tend to think I see strengths and weaknesses in both approaches. If I'm absolutely for it, you put a gun to my head, yeah, I, I, but no one's doing that. I, I, can, I can use both, so why do I have to fight? That's kind of where I've landed practically. Uh, maybe people think I'm mm -hmm. a compromiser, but it sounded to me like you use the literal translations yourself, even though you're on the NIV absolutely. committee. Yeah. yeah, and I would say what you just described is the definition of scholarship. And that is understanding both sides and bringing out the best of, of both. So I, I think that we, that's what we need to teach our students is scholarship. I, I jokingly tell my students, don't become an apologist. An apologist knows what they believe already, and they're going to defend that come hell or high water. You know, instead, be a, be a, a truth seeker. That should be our goal. And if, if that's the case, then let's, let's present both sides and, and, and engage the arguments for both sides. Yeah, there, there was a lay person, uh, of a woman who has a YouTube channel where she talks about Bible interpretation and Bible reading. And I, I want to say Bible journaling, which is not something I actually do, but somehow I stumbled on this video of hers. And she said something that just really struck me as incredibly wise. She said, if a bunch of smart people are arguing over a particular point, each side probably has some strength that you need to look for. Mm -hmm. It's comparatively rare that intelligent, educated people would <laughs> take a side that is completely wrong. And I think of what C.S. Lewis said, that even pagan religions have some aspect of the truth or they wouldn't be appealing to anybody. So I felt that was a humble and really, um, it's a way forward that acknowledges the limitations built into humans. Okay, I, I love that discussion with you. We could go on about that, but I wanna go on about <laughs> one of your 40 questions. One of them was, what are the challenges of translating implicit material? I thought that was a really fascinating chapter. So Dr. Strauss, what are the challenges? Part of um, interpretation and translation in general is this idea of a, what we call assumptions, presuppositions, um, background understandings, and worldview. Um, and Im implicit uh, meaning is meaning that is culturally embedded, that people know already when they come and approach the text and, and read the text. Um, and so um, an example of that is, you know, the text might say, and Paul entered Asia, um, and we, um, reading that from our contemporary context, we would think that that means the continent of Asia. But in fact, the reader, the original readers were well aware that this meant the province, the Roman province of Asia. So the province of Asia is implicit knowledge that, that the readers brought to the task, but contemporary readers may not. And so the question is, can you, should you include implicit knowledge, uh, implicit um, meaning in the text? Some would say, if, you know, no, because we're just, we just want to say what's, what's said, not what is implied. But in fact, what is implied is part of the meaning. So if we're going to communicate the meaning of the text, we want to include implicit knowledge. How much to include? You know, you, you don't want to make it a commentary where you explain everything about the background all along the way. Um, so. Uh, um, another example is, is the text might say um, he crossed the Jordan. Um, well, that's the Jordan River. Do you always include the word river just to make it clear what it is? Well, it depends on your audience, if your audience would potentially misunderstand it. Uh, where it might get a little more controversial is the New Living Translation um, in the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector refers to the tax collector as a despised tax collector. 
Well, there's no Greek word for despised there. Um, so this is adding implicit knowledge that the readers would know, but the modern reader may not. Not every tax collector today is, is despised, you know. So um, that, that's, you know, the, the, the debate is when do you include it and when do you not? I think in, you include it when the reader is likely to misunderstand it um, if you don't include that implicit Sharp-eyed readers who can see through the bokeh in the background of my shot, you know, the, the blurred out area, might be able to see on the top shelf, I'm going to point to it, I've got Robert Alter's uh, three-volume translation with tons and tons of notes of the Old Testament, and he wrote a little book on the mm -hmm. art of Bible translation, and what really stuck with me was his acknowledgement repeatedly that all translation forces very difficult questions and requires compromises mm -hmm. that are not going to make anybody entirely happy. And I think you're reflecting that. How far do we go with the translation of implicit information? When does it cross a line into too much interpretation? Uh, I think it would be a little disarming for some critics of the NIV, I, you know, whom I encounter all the time, um, to hear you acknowledge that's a question that you've wrestled with. You don't just blithely go past it. Uh, another question for you. Which question or questions of these 40 forced you to dig deepest? I mean, a lot of this stuff, I've heard you say it. I read the Challenge of Bible Translation, uh, which I think you helped edit, and I can't remember, but I'm sure you had an essay or two in there. Mm -hmm. You know, this is familiar material yeah. for you, but where did you have to break new ground? Well, the whole section on international Bible translation, um, I have, I've learned enormously. Uh, biblical scholars need to listen to those doing international transla translation around the world. And so that's the area where I am least familiar with in many ways, even though I've learned a great deal from my colleagues in that, in that field. And so, you know, for example, examining, you know, what are the languages that have the most speakers in the world? And what are the primary Bible translations in those languages, in Spanish, in French, in Chinese, in Hindi? Um, and so that was a, a lot of learning curve with that and um, fascinating stuff. And uh, they're the real heroes, by the way, those doing international Bible, Bible translation. We have so many English versions, a wealth of them, but some languages have no Bible yet in, in their language. And so um, that, that was probably the, the most at least the part I needed to do the most research in because I really did not know that much um, about what was going on around the world. I appreciate that. Yeah, I find it fascinating. I've supported financially missionaries over the years, friends of mine who are Bible translators, and uh, I always loved it when they would send their prayer letters and there would be this little section some little tidbit that they learned about the Bible because they were forced <laughs> to ask questions because of the different structure of the language that they're using. One of my friends is a translator in Cambodia and a brilliant guy, and he's given his life to this relatively small, you know, worldwide, uh, speaking worldwide, uh, language group to make sure they have God's word. And now he's learning so much even more about God's word because of these questions that are forced on him. Mm -hmm. Speaking of questions, I wondered if I could ask question 41, and I'm gonna get kind of personal here. This is one of my most important questions personally, sort of as an apologetics question for myself, as someone who works on English Bible translation. I ask the Lord on a pretty regular basis in prayer this question, and I'm going to step down just a few notches and ask you now, Dr. Strauss. Why would the Lord give us such a complicated <laughs> linguistic situation when it comes to textual criticism and Bible translation? one that's difficult to explain to the uninitiated, you know, that requires a book like this, and then leaves ripe opportunities for conspiracy theorists like the King James Only crowd. Um, or would you resist the way I frame the question? Could you help me with this? <laughs> yeah, I, I think I would resist the way because that, that's, I think I'd say that's life, isn't it? I mean, why did God, does God exist as a trinity when we, it blows our mind even to really try to understand and comprehend that? Um, why did God save us through the incarnation when that concept of God becoming a human being is inconceivable? I mean, I don't, I don't think we talk about that enough in terms of um, the difficulty there. Um, you know, when Jesus was born, where was his divine consciousness? You know, did he know everything. Um, did, 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 in what sense can anyone be fully human and fully divine? So I think the mysteries of, of God are just 
beyond us in, in, in so many different ways. And, um, you know, it, so, so we shouldn't be so surprised, I suppose, that God used um, a fallible human instrument, language. I mean, language itself is always has a measure of imprecision, ambiguity and imprecision. Um, and, you know, and the process of copying from, uh, language. I mean, God didn't invent the printing press or Xerox before he invented the Bible. That would have been really helpful. Then we would have perfect copies. You know, he could have handed them out to us. The translation process itself, that's something, you know, we have the saying, something is always lost in the translation. And that is true. Anyone who does translation realizes that. There's a little essay by Moses Silva um, at the beginning of that book you just mentioned, The Challenge of Bible Translation. It's a great little essay by, by Silva. And he basically talks about when he was, uh, I think it was in his first year of seminary, one of his professors, he's Spanish speaking, he's from um, Cuba, I believe. He's Spanish speaking, and one of his professors asked him to translate an article from Spanish into English. Um, and, and it drove him crazy, because he thought this should be the simplest thing in the world. You know, he's fluent in both languages. But it drove him crazy because he couldn't quite, he wanted it to be right, and he couldn't quite get it right. It was impossible to get it right, because the languages just did not line up. And that's the frustration. Why would God, you know, allow that to happen? Well, <laughs> that's, that's our human existence has that kind of ambiguity and imprecision. So I suppose we shouldn't be surprised that, that language itself, how we communicate, has that. But as I always tell my students, you can, it can be true without being absolute or without being perfect. Um, you know, that's the way, that's the way life is. We know, we know in part, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, um, and so we're not going, until we see Christ face to face, we're not going to know perfectly. And so we shouldn't expect to know perfectly in terms of, of language as well. Even monolingual so. people can learn this lesson. I was actually recently given the opportunity to contribute to a series of um, lightly abridged, and I would just say translated, Puritan work. So I was given a short Puritan work. And it's written, of course, in very flowery 16th century English with its long sentences. And I'm asked to put it into contemporary English. And of all people <laughs> in the world, I mean, this should have been right up my alley because I've been spending so much time on this. <laughs> and I found it vexingly difficult. I do think you're right to say this is just one of many difficulties the Lord has presented us with because we're fallen and we are finite. And what does this generate? It generates people like you who dig deep into God's creation of language and explore these questions. And that in itself is a God-honoring thing. You've done a good work for the church in this 40 Questions book. So let's get back to some controversy. I'm actually going to get to it through uh, a weird means. Vern Poitras is a great friend of mine. I dearly love him. I run his website. He, I assigned to my seminary students an excellent essay in his book, Symphonic Theology, uh, called Words and Precision, where he says exactly what you've just said, that language is just not infinitely precise. I don't want to actually just pit you guys against one another here. I'm just using a little segue. Uh, I have friends I love on both sides of the gender language debate. So I, I'm going to beg your indulgence as I make this question even longer. I took down a section of what you wrote on page 163. Here, I've got it here, but I'm going to read it off the teleprompter because it's easier. You say you take a mediating approach. You wrote, to achieve readability, translators should generally follow a descriptive rather than descriptive approach. I'm sorry, than a prescriptive approach. The goal should be to identify how people actually speak rather than to mandate how they ought to speak. As a linguist, I'm saying amen. If masculine generics like man are being replaced by more inclusive terms in contemporary English, then translators should follow suit. Concerning accuracy, you said, gender inclusive language should be used if it more accurately reflects the meaning of the text. I'm gonna keep reading. When the author is referring to males, the word men should be used. When both men and women are included, persons or people are more precise and so more accurate. Now, this is the position that I myself have taken in my own YouTube videos and in my writing. But I wondered, as sort of an effort toward peacemaking in a, in a setting where this is still touchy, right? I don't think it's as touchy as it was when that World Magazine cover came out. Uh, as you point out in the book, you know, the CSB and the ESV, are, are, you know, contemporary translations are now doing some of these kinds of things. But as an effort toward peace, can you describe the two poles mm. between which you are mediating? You know, find, find some area of agreement across this little divide we've got in evangelicalism. What do you reject on either side? 
Sure, sure, yeah. Well, that's a, that's a great question. It made me think as well. Um, um, and I think on one side, you do have those who are engaged and actively seeking to change the language. Uh, they would say, for example, that masculine generics are implicitly, in, inherently, I'm sorry, inherently evil in the sense that they, they support and encourage a patriarchy that has been misogynist, that, is, that has been negative towards women, and that we need to change the way we speak. And so they require, you know, they, you know the whole pronoun debate, for, for example, how, you know, how do we refer to men and women with pronouns? Um, is, should male generics ever be used, um, or are they in fact um, inherently in fact evil? Yeah, um, right. inherently evil or wrong. And so, you know, I, I understand the motivation behind that, by the way, because there has been enormous injustice um, ar around the world, and women have been treated. You know, misogyny is, is real, and uh, you know, the Me Too movement. We've seen all right. all these things. Um, most of us would support women having the vote. Well, it wasn't sure. that long ago that they didn't have the right. vote. So, you know, whatever someone sort of uses the word feminist as inherently or, or always negative, you know, I think, don't you think there has been injustice that we need to seek for justice? Right. So there's there's positives to that, but um, there's also negatives. I think we can, we can well go overboard um, in trying to reconstruct language and, and require people to speak in a politically correct way. So that's, that's one extreme. The other extreme, um, and, and Vern has made some statements that I would challenge, and, and that is that God designed the language to be just what it was. And so masculine generics are actually designed by God to emphasize the male priority, male leadership, male authority, and so forth. Um, and I would, I would Again, I, I want to say there's some truth in that, perhaps, but for the most part, I just don't think that's right. I think God has allowed languages to evolve. If we say that, then what about those languages that don't use masculine generics? Are they inherently inferior? And can we not really, you know, precisely present God's word in those languages? Um, you know, in, in Spanish, the word for person, la persona, is feminine. Um, so should we say, you know, she with every time that person when we translate into Spanish, is there something inherently wrong about Spanish because of that? Or make it say um, el so persono, I, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that would be another option. I'm sorry to break in there. Right, we, yeah. could, we could reconstruct Spanish and force people to use mass, you know, change it into a masculine term. And I just don't think that's, that's right. I think we need to recognize that languages evolve and we take the language that people speak and we seek to translate that. Um, now, are we you know, urging people in one direction. If I, I, I tell my students, I want you to use gender inclusive language in, in this research paper you're doing, um, am I imposing some, something on them or am I just, you know, telling them to, to be good writers in our contemporary society? Well, there's not an absolute answer to that. I, I recognize that. So I, I tend, my, my mediating position is I would encourage gender inclusive language. I wouldn't require it. And I don't circle every time they say the word man. In their, in their essay. Um, if, it's, if it's sort of blatant and it seems, you know, just jarring, I might say, don't you mean people or something like that in the, in the, but again, that's a balance. I have to maintain that balance as to sort of guiding them in what I think to be just is good writing, clear communication in our contemporary society, and then imposing something from without and forcing them to be kind of politically correct in their language. So uh, again, I think we need balance and gracious discernment right. um, and a lot of tolerance for each other in this regard. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're expressing my heart here. I love people on both sides of this debate. And Don Carson, of course, you know, one of the founders of TGC, which is not just officially, but actually a complementarian organization. And yet he wrote a book similar to yours where he's defending gender accurate language, whatever language you want to use. I've actually wondered, you know, I'm not old enough to have been in the room for some of these disputes, but I'm looking at people I really love and respect on both sides and thinking that actually, if we can get kind of rid of some of the personal stuff that has happened, you know, now going back, boy, more than 20 years, 25 years, um, I'm, I think that both sides are rejecting a lot of the same things on the two poles and that therefore both sides are in some way mediating and maybe have a yeah. little more agreement than the pamphleteering has reflected. Anyway, thank you for 
weighing in on that touchy topic, and I appreciate that. Let me go on now. Let's move away from gender, please. Let's talk about something less controversial, like King James onlyism. So, I'm told constantly (laughs) that the only reason modern English Bible translations exist in the first place is money, 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 money. So, you personally, Dr. Strauss, actually, I've asked Vern Poitras this as well. Have you been made wealthy by your work on the NIV? I mean, <laughs> and, and a little more seriously, way more seriously, and I want to ask this very straightforwardly. Do you see money affecting the work of the Committee on Bible Translation, you know, the group responsible for the NIV? Yeah. There, there, there's no doubt that um, Bible translation is a big business. It is a business in many ways because um, Bibles sell. I mean, every year the Bible is the best-selling volume you know, around and and so what translation people choose and purchase is going to be, uh, you know, affect things. Finances are going to be a factor. Um, how do we defend against that? Um, I can talk about the NIV a little bit, and then we can maybe follow up with that. Is the the Committee on Bible Translation is an independent organization. Um, we are sponsored by Biblica, formerly the International Bible Society, which is a nonprofit whose mission is to disseminate God's word around the world. They, they began as the New York Bible Society distributing scriptures for hundreds of years. They've been doing that. Um, and, and then evolved into a, a larger international translation organization. Um, they sponsored the production of the NIV and they are the copyright holders to the NIV. So they are a nonprofit. Their goal is just to get the word out. Um, the CBT then is actually um, an independent body that they, they sponsor. Uh, we do not answer to them. We produce a text and then deliver it to them. They don't change our text. So it's denominations or um, individuals or publishers are not telling us how to translate. Uh, the, the CBT, um, we bring on new people. Um, we're, we're a self-sustaining or, uh, committee. So when a member retires or passes away, um, we look around to who we think would be uh, the, the best scholar to replace them on the committee and we approach that person and they come in. Um, usually there's a year of sort of getting to know each other and then we, we vote on that person whether to bring them in or not. But that, that is independent of the, of the um, Biblica. The primary publisher, the commercial publisher is Zondervan. But again, Zondervan does not tell us what to do. They don't determine any of the decisions. So. So try, our goal is to stay faithful to God's word, to represent the meaning of the text as accurately as, as, as possible. And knowing the committee members, that's really their passion. Um, as I said, they're all biblical scholars. When we meet together um, every morning, someone brings a devotion. Um, we take our work very seriously in terms of we are handling God's word. And our goal is to reflect as accurately as possible uh, the meaning and message of God's word in contemporary, in contemporary English. Um, and we're not going to make everybody happy, obviously, in every case. Um, but, and we're not going to be objective, absolutely. No one is, is fully sure. objective. But our goal is to reflect the author's intended meaning um, in, in English that the broadest English audience will, will understand. Well, the, the King James only is certainly are not happy. And I'll have another question about that in a second. But I want to back up what you just said. I was actually talking with uh, someone who works at Zondervan and who interfaces with the Committee on Bible Translation. And this individual in the conversation we had, and sort of a holy hush came over it when I mentioned uh, those interactions, because I won't reveal any identity here. This individual said to me, I'm just going to have to say she, it's a, it's a woman. She said that she's very careful in the kinds of proposals that she makes when, they, when it comes to formatting. Um, she treats the committee as, uh, with kid gloves because she recognizes they have a very, very important stewardship. So mm-hmm. I've seen that up close and personally, and I've watched the Committee on Bible Translation. I've watched the kind of exegetical work that they do outside of the NIV, mm-hmm. and I know how it works. No one's going to be thinking to themselves, all right, I'm looking for a way for complementarians or egalitarians to pass money under the table so I can change Genesis 3.16 to the way that best suits, you know, whoever's going to be the highest bidder. It just does not work that way. I appreciate you just saying that very simple thing out loud. Uh, Though you didn't answer the question if you've been made wealthy, and I'm trying to look for your watch. Like, how expensive is the watch (laughs) that you're wearing right now? I don't even wear a watch. Oh, okay. So you haven't been made wealthy. It's it's all on my phone these days. Yeah. Great. I do. Um, I, I do love watches. I've got a Seiko. 
Uh, <laughs> nice. Did you have a follow up com- follow up comment on that? N- no, I mean, um, we we they pay us by the hour basically for our preparation, um, and then the time that we are together, they do pay us by the hour. Um, a, a standard professional rate. It's not going to make any of us rich. Um, most of us, most all of us, are research scholars as well. So we're writing commentaries and and other books and so forth. And of course, money comes in from that. But as I think most people know, these are not generally bestsellers, and right. so most none of us are getting getting rich over, or on that. But um, but yeah, I do I do want to acknowledge that that it is big business, and that's something we need to take very seriously and carefully, and we need to put up. Um, ca- you know, we need to walls put of protection yeah, walls, I don't around know, the Committee on Bible Translation. Around all translation. And, and we need to find ways to check ourselves and make sure that we're not, um, we're not going into this in a way that, that is, is meant to, you know, put other translations down so we can right. make more, ours can make more money and so forth. I think uh, we need to operate from Christian principles in terms of our interactions with each other and the way we criticize um, one another's work. I think that's ve- we have to be very careful about that. We don't want to you know, criticize in such a way that it gives the Christian public the wrong understanding right. of Bible translation. As soon as we see, suggest that our translation is the only good one or even our translation is always the best, I think what we are doing is we're undermining Amen. people's faith in the authority of Scripture. And I think we need to be really careful about doing that. That it does my heart so much good to hear you say that, Dr. Strauss. Not that I'm surprised, I mean, especially after after reading this, but I feel like, you know, I, in my in my very small perch within evangelicalism, one of my jobs is to help steward the trust of the church and all of the embarrassment of riches that we have in our major modern evangelical English Bible translations. And my job is made harder when people in your position at any translation talk in a jingoistic, you know, triumphalistic way about their translation philosophy or um, uh, the decisions they've made. And I know it doesn't sell to say, our translation is one among many good translations, but it's (laughs) honest and it preserves the trust that a lot of lay people who just don't have a dog in the fight, you know, ought to have in the good translations Mm -hmm. around them. I complain to pastors all the time. Um, nicely, and I try to do it not in person but through articles, work very hard to keep the ratio of criticism to praise, you know, pretty pretty much the same when it comes to all major evangelical translations. Mm-hmm. You know, I had talked to one pastor where just, you know, did you realize that every single reference you make to translation X is negative? And I know you don't mm-hmm. think the whole thing's trash. Yeah, I think this is so very important. Okay, I think this might be my final question. This very morning, I was watching a YouTube video by a King James Onlyist who did his best to link the NIV and other modern Bible translations to the Jehovah's Witnesses. So similar to my last (laughs) question, you know, because of my work, I get to ask you this. What do you say to the insistent claims from the King James Only world that the NIV is working to undermine the doctrine of the Trinity and the deity of Christ? Yeah, and if you look at the basis for that claim, it's usually the fact that um, the critical text, the Greek text that, texts that lie behind the, King, the, the modern versions, it's not the NIV, it's, it's all modern versions with right. very few ex- exceptions. The New King James is the only exception, really, uh, that, that is, has And any, the modern English uh, version, which isn't quite as popular, but, you know, still counts right, as major. Right, right. That is widely available. Those would be the only two that would be really widely av- available. Um, but um, uh, that all, all translations follow what we call the critical text. Apart from those few, they follow the critical text. And um, it becomes a question of how do you determine what the original text of Scripture, scripture is? And the, the question about the Trinity is, really arises because in our manuscript tradition, we have something like 6,000 manuscripts of the Greek, portions of the Greek New Testament. The vast majority of those are what we call part of the Byzantine family. And the Byzantine family appears to the vast majority of scholars to be kind of a standardization of the text um, that became the standard text. But it became the standard text by, in some ways, harmonizing a variety of traditions, smoothing over difficulties. And one of the ways we see this a lot is what I think James White calls, um, he refers to them as expansions of piety. Yeah. Expansions of piety. So 
For example, one manuscript says the Lord Jesus, another manuscript says the Lord Jesus Christ, hmm. um, or our Lord um, Jesus, uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Um, and when you ask the question, which is more likely to be original? Well, copyists or scribes who are copying the text, would they be more likely to take away the, way, the word Lord or Christ, or were they more likely to add it? Well, it becomes obvious, I think, just intuitively, it becomes obvious that they're going to add these expansions because that's the way they spoke. Um, and so the longer readings or the reading, the expansions of piety, um, from the perspective of doing textual criticism, trying to determine the original sure. text of Scripture, um, are, are always going to be um, on the shorter reading, in that case, the Lord Jesus um, rather than the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you look at lists, you can see the Byzantine manuscripts inevitably have those longer readings. Well, they're going to be, it's going to be more a higher Christology, naturally, because that's the tendency of the copyists. And so what do we want? Do we want the original text of Scripture or do we want the most orthodox text of Scripture? In other words, I could go through, and every time it says Jesus, I could say, our Lord Jesus Christ. If we go through the Gospels, and every time it refers to Jesus, let's just say, our Lord Jesus Christ, or our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that would be a much better Bible, wouldn't it? Because it would be much more orthodox, much more emphasizing the deity of Christ. Most of us would not want to do that because we would say, okay, but that's not what the author said. That's not the original text. Our goal is not to make it a more orthodox text. Our goal is to make it a more accurate text, closer to what the original actually said. Um, and so to say, to argue that the King James Version is more Trinitarian or more fo emphasizes the deity of Christ only tells us that later scribes are, were naturally inclined to add these kind of compliments rather than to take, take them away. Um, and our goal should not be to make the text more orthodox. We could do that. We could solve all of the problems in the text. Every historical difficulty we could just smooth out by, by changing the, the, the wording of the text. But none of us wants to do that because our goal is to right. get back to what the text actually said, not to make it more conservative or more orthodox. Right. Yeah, yeah I, I have attempted to give that very answer, you know, countless times. Ultimately, I found it is inherently complex. And that's one of the reasons that I brought up that question to the Lord that I mentioned earlier. Why does it have to be so hard? Because people's <laughs> eyes just glaze over. They, they, they oftentimes can't follow all that. So can I cut to something of the quick here? Do you believe in the Trinity? Well, let me just say one thing oh, with that, ahead. Mark. Mark, you have done a masterful job of popularizing oh, this material. Your work is just phenomenal. In that, my, my whole life has been about popularizing and making right. complex and difficult material understandable. And, and you are a master at that. So what you've done in terms of the, the King James only material is just phenomenal. I just have, have to say that. I know we're talking about me, not you, but right. I just have to say that in this context. Well, that's entirely unexpected and very much appreciated. Um, and that's one reason I'm talking to you, right? I can tell we're on the same page here. We're trying to serve the church with some complex material, trying to make it accessible. Um, so let, let me, though, get back to the question I wanted to ask. One way, I think, to cut through all of the difficulty here, and I just did this on a YouTube comment on that very video I mentioned at King James Onlyist. I just said, for example, with Crossway, but the same would be true of you. Okay, so the, the ESV is put up by Crossway, and supposedly they're trying to undermine the doctrines of the of the Trinity and of the deity of Christ. Well, Crossway also puts out numerous books that are defending and explaining those two doctrines. So how does that make sense? And I just wanted to ask you, Dr. Strauss, do you believe in the Trinity? Do you believe in the deity of Christ? <laughs> Absolutely. And, it, and again, look at the writings of the CBT members. Um, right. Like Doug Moo, like Craig Blomberg, like Bruce Waltke, you know, and on and on and on. And you can see these, these are some of the strongest defenders of the Christian faith. Um, but ultimately our goal, we need to be truth seekers, right. um, not depending our pre defending our preconceived conceptions or ideas, but we need to seek the truth of God's word. And that's that's needs to be our, our goal all the time. Amen. What a great place to end. Thank you, Dr. Strauss, for joining me for this episode of Logos Live. I really like to thank you, who, the way you did, so graciously did for me for your work on Bible translation, your work of, uh, of not just doing Bible translation, but explaining it to the church, Dr. Strauss. Thank you so much for coming on Logos Live. My pleasure. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate the interview.
Join us again next time on Logos Live for more scintillating conversation with biblical scholars. Logos is the tool that I use myself in all my Bible teaching in church and in anything that might be called biblical scholarship. And you heard folks, Dr. Strauss uses it as well, as well as one of our competitors, which is totally fine. The Logos software is available at logos.com. And uh, thank you again for joining us.